Why is it taking me so long to wake up? In response to a couple of comments and questions on my previous video, I decided to make a follow-up video to answer this common concern. I've heard this many, many times in different settings with different descriptions of length of time someone has been practicing. Uh, I've heard people tell me I've been working at this for a few years. I've had people tell me I've been working at it for a couple of decades and haven't woken up yet. So I wanted to make this video to discuss some of the issues that play into this and give a few pointers that if you find yourself in this frustrating position may help you. So first of all, when I talk about awakening or first awakening, I do mean a significant fundamental shift in the way we experience ourself and the way we experience reality and the way we experience thought. So if that's not clear, check out the playlist on awakening basics or approaching awakening. Also, I have a book about this process that is largely geared toward this first shift called Awake, It's Your Turn. It's on Amazon. So just to be clear that that's what I'm referring to, I'm not referring to an experiential taste, a mystical experience, all of which are fine and often are precursors. But I'm talking to that true shift in what you take yourself to be in identity. So how long does that take? Well, it varies. I've talked to people for two or three hours, and then a few hours after that, they had an awakening. This has happened a couple of times, maybe three times that I can think of. More common than that is somebody who is really gung-ho. They hear this message in a way that really deeply resonates, and they understand and see that this is the only thing that's truly important to them. This doesn't mean that they run off and join a monastery or stop working or going to school, because typically they don't. But it means that they realize that without this shift, without this fundamental change in perception, the suffering that they've been noticing for their entire life is just going to go on and on. So when somebody's that aggressively interested in awakening, they tend to wake up pretty quickly. I've seen it in a few weeks. I've seen it in a few months. But somebody who's really that serious about it, authentically serious about it, that it is absolutely the most important thing to them. I would say a few months to a few years is probably the most likely answer to that question of how long it's going to take. There are other people who are peripherally interested in awakening or interested in spirituality, meditating, inquiry, reading books, going to retreats, and they're sort of lukewarm to the idea of awakening, although they are certainly interested in spirituality, in living a more peaceful life, in investigating the deeper truths. But when it comes to awakening itself, they're a little iffy, and they'll often say this. Like, I'm not sure if I'm ready for that yet, or I'm not ready for that yet. Um, I've heard this quite a bit. So someone in that position, I would suggest just keep doing what you're doing. Keep investigating. Find out what's most important to you. Dig in, meditate, inquire. Meet people who you really deeply resonate with, who seem to be pointing to a fundamental truth, a living truth that you feel is true, real, possible in some way, but maybe inaccessible to you in the immediate. Sometimes just meeting the right person, interacting with them can make a significant shift for you. So people that fall into this category, I find after a few years of practice or sometimes longer, they start to really perceive something deeper, something at the nucleus of all of these traditions, Buddhism, Zen, Dzogchen, Advaita Vedanta. And then they kind of fall into that first category where they're like, I'm ready. I'm ready to really dig in. I'm ready to really find the truth of what I am. And I'm willing to sacrifice for that. Meaning I'm willing to be uncomfortable. I'm willing to prioritize. I'm willing to 
to various degrees, let go of a lot of my other agendas, meaning the need for validation, position, money, comfort, security, relationship, love, sex, being heard, being seen, etc. Doesn't mean you give all those things up. It means that you're really honest with yourself and you say, hey, this is actually a priority over all of those. Although it doesn't mean I have to eradicate all of those areas of my life and focus 100% of my time and effort on awakening because almost no one can do that. Almost no one will do that. So that's sort of the second category of how interested and serious someone is about awakening in the immediate. And neither of these are better ways of being at all. In fact, I'm not even sure you can choose which category you're in. It's just a karmic thing. And if you're a little more in that second category and you wish you were in the first category, don't. It's really uncomfortable. It's, it's really uncomfortable to be in that first category and feel nothing but suffering all the time or the vast majority of your life, relationships, experiences, successes, connection, all of it just feels tainted somehow. It feels tainted by this suffering that you can't put your finger on, but you know you have to get under it. So it's not a comfortable place to be. I think Eckhart Tolle said for the first 29 years of his life, he felt depression and anxiety and suicidal ideation nearly constantly. For me, until I was 24, I was pretty miserable. I mean, I had periods where I felt okay, but for the most part, the thoughts just crowded in. It felt like a pressure cooker. It was brutal. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, really, unless they're ready to wake up. Then I would. So there's probably a, a karmic background that kind of puts you where you need to be um, as far as your comfort level and so forth. And then maybe there's a third category of people who are really peripherally interested in spirituality, but not really interested in awakening, or they just know they're not ready for it or not that interested in it. Often it's because they're enjoying their life and they have a good life and good relationships and they don't seem to suffer very much or they're not completely in contact with their suffering or whatever. So that's fine, of course. There's no pressure, there's no judgment anywhere. If you find that you're interested in meditation and spiritual topics, but when the topic of awakening or transformation or liberation or no self comes into the conversation, you have an aversion to it, that's fine too, of course, it doesn't matter. You don't have to push yourself in the ways that we talk about here to make that first shift. So meditate, enjoy your life, let it augment the enjoyment, the natural enjoyment of being alive. Because in the final analysis, what you realize through liberation is there is no separation. There aren't selves in some people and other people walk around without selves in them. There's no such thing as a self. There's no such thing as a separate entity. It just doesn't exist. And reality looks very, very different when that's realized. So it doesn't really matter how awake or asleep a person is because that's just a mental process. There's really no one in that. There's no one experiencing that mental process or suffering from that mental process, even though it sure feels like it at times. So it's fine. It doesn't really matter how serious you are about awakening. You, it's built into the system. If you're really serious about it, that comes with a lot of suffering. If you're not that serious about it at this time, that's fine. Just enjoy, you know, spiritual topics and retreats and whatever you resonate with. And at some point it may become very interesting to you or it may not, it doesn't really matter. So to back up to the original intent of the video, which was to answer the question, why is awakening taking me so long? I often find, although there's no absolute rules to this, the people that ask that question are sort of in that second category. Because people who absolutely have to wake up and they don't care what it takes or what it costs, they don't negotiate with it, really. They ask questions, they dig in, they find the right people, and if that person's not deeply realized enough to point them, they find someone else. They just move on. And it's kind of an obsession almost. But if there's some negotiation or frustration around awakening. Part of your identity says, you know, I really want to wake up, but it hasn't happened for me yet. Why is that? And I feel some angst around it or anger or frustration or jealousy or whatever. Often that's the sign of a sort of competing agenda that you probably really do want to wake up. For the most part, this is what I find. 
that there is a, an authentic movement to awaken. But identity is really clinging on to this other part of ourself that paradoxically can actually seem interested in awakening, but it's not really. Another way of saying this is the ego itself doesn't really want to wake up. I've said before, the ego kind of has two jobs. One is survival and the other is to try to feel better or make you feel better. The problem is it wants to survive a little bit more than it wants to feel better. So when it starts to detect what awakening really is, a critical blow to the ego structure, or at least the beginning of the end, it's not so interested in it anymore. The ego can't want this, really, ultimately. The ego is the thing, the collection of thoughts, the movement of mind that's keeping, I don't want to say keeping you asleep because you're not really asleep. There's no one asleep. There's no one awake. But it's keeping attention directed into thoughts. And it keeps attention directed in the thoughts that work. Right? Whatever works for you, that's where your attention is going to remain. So if it's a sort of competitiveness, um, I wish I had that awakening that I see other people talking about. Uh, I wish that would happen for me. Why hasn't it happened for me? That's fine. Notice that. Notice those thoughts. Notice those impressions. Notice the emotions, right? Jealousy, fear of missing out, competitiveness, whatever it is. But also hear this. That's not the direction to look for awakening. That's the actually part of yourself that's comforting you. It's not comfortable, but it's more comfortable than the unknown, right? Because to direct yourself directly into the unknown, you're going to even abandon the comfort of knowing how things are for you, even if it has to do with a story of being the one that's missing out on something specific or want something they don't have or whatever the emotional landscape and narrative describe. It's easy to miss interpret what the ego is saying about awakening by believing that it's actually talking about awakening. It's not. The ego doesn't know what awakening is. The thought process does not know what awakening is. It can't. But it is really good at catching your attention. If it has a job, its job is to be the clown that catches your attention. It does a trick. It's like, over here, over here, over here. Pay attention. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Right? Whatever works for you, that's the one it's going to keep doing. So if the trick is, I feel like I'm missing out on something, that's the trick it's going to keep playing on you. If the trick is, I'm just not good enough, and no matter what I do, I'm not good enough, and I know that, that's the trick it's going to play. If it's, you know, I just don't understand all this, this awakening stuff, the spiritual stuff. If I could understand it better, if I could read more, find more information on it, then I'd have an awakening. That's what it's going to say. It's going to say that if you believe it, and it, and it distracts your attention enough, right? So noticing this, noticing that those pulls, those distractions, really those narratives, those stories, even if they feel familiar, like they're about you. And the only reason they feel like they're about you isn't because there's a you that they're about. It's because the story's been playing so long and it makes sense for you and it works for you. But it's not true when it comes to awakening. Now, it might work in other areas of your life as well. The narratives, stories, a lot of times our relationships are formed around them, right? If I'm the smart one, the attractive one, the whatever, the victim, the victimizer, the whatever, all these different narratives we have, these beliefs we have about ourselves, the habitual thought patterns, those fit in like a puzzle piece into the rest of our life in a certain way. But that puzzle, that world of narrative making and rearranging and trying to fix the narrative and make it better, that's just not what awakening is. Awakening is seeing that that's not what you really are. That's not what's really going on. It's a distraction. It's fine in and of itself. You don't have to try to make that not be there, but that's not where you look for awakening. To clarify that or summarize, what I often find when I hear that it's taking too long, I don't know what's going on, I don't know what went wrong with my practice, when I hear those types of comments um, in my experience, often it's some sort of competing agenda. And I can even simplify that more. And when I simplify that more, it comes down to kind of the pinnacle of what awakening actually is and what it means for anyone. And that is mistaking thoughts for reality. Right? This gets very simple. And that's the beauty of it. Whether you take a one-pointed approach, a self-inquiry approach, a de-identifying from thought approach, ultimately it comes down to seeing that you, what you are, 
not the thought about you, not a belief about you, but what you actually are as you experience yourself right now has nothing to do with thoughts. Thoughts are reflections that seem to say something about it, and that's fine. But that's not what you are. That's not the sense of I am the sense, not the word, not the belief, not the thought. Right where you are. Ultimately, that's what causes that first awakening to see clearly enough for long enough that all of those thought narratives, all the beliefs, all the stories just don't refer to what you actually are. And this is verifiable in the immediate. So forget about other people's awakenings. You can't know them. In fact, by the time you hear about them, it's a story anyway. That person that had the awakening, they can never describe what happened. It's impossible. All they can do is turn it into words, and then you receive the words, and you turn them into a mental construct. You turn them into a picture you're watching on the storyboard of your mind. But that picture, that storyboard, which is all you can know of their awakening, is not your awakening. It's not what awakening is. It's just not. Awakening is the one watching the storyboard, but it's also the one watching every storyboard, every story you've ever seen, every belief you've ever had about yourself. And it's the one reacting to all of that, importantly. But it's also what's there when there's no reaction, when there's no story. So there are a few strategies to get at this, and I describe them in multiple places. But one is self-inquiry. Notice any thought, but be vigilant about what a thought is. Just wait for it. And if a thought says, gosh, I never wake up. I've been at this for so long. Oh, okay. That's a thought occurring right now. I don't care how many times it's been there before. I can't know that. But I can know right now that thought seemed to occur. Now, the narrative of the thought says, I haven't had an awakening. And it's been a long time. I must be doing something wrong. Great. It's in the first person. That thought is in the first person. But who are you that's aware of the thought right now? Look there. Settle there. You can't really look there because you're looking from there. But settle there. Notice. Oh, my God. That thought could come and say, I haven't had an awakening forever. And something seems to believe that. But it's really just the next thought that believes it when you start to contemplate it. But what if a thought came by and said, I'm the Queen of England? Would that make you feel like the Queen of England? Hopefully not, right? So if two thoughts can give extremely different effects of perception, and yet the one that's aware of those thoughts did not change between the thoughts, what's real, the thoughts or the one that's aware of the thoughts? So do you see, when you believe the thought, there can be a reaction. When you start to really feel into what it is that's aware of the thoughts, noticing the thoughts come and go, come and go, come and go. And you realize, oh my gosh, it's always been there. Just this. Then you get interested in it and you find a way to just stay there. Or the rubber band got so tight from looking, 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 looking for awakening self. I am that it snaps back and you don't have to try to stay anywhere. It's just here. So simple. This is why people laugh and cry at the same time. <laughs> because it's just absurd that you ever look for a self. So there's one approach. Another approach is to just de-identify from thoughts. This is sort of how it worked for me. What happened for me is kind of a combination of all these, but I just became really interested that, oh my gosh, every thought that comes seems to color my experience. Like I believe it. Someone's telling me a story in my mind. Why am I believing the story? It doesn't make any sense. And especially since most of them made me feel bad. So I just got interested. Okay, let's see. Let's see what the next thought is. And it would be an image of me standing up and walking across the room. Oh, that's a thought. Because I didn't stand up and walk across the room. So that's a thought. Okay, what else? Oh, some narrative that says, blah, blah, blah. What am I doing? This doesn't make sense. Oh, another thought. That's a narrative thought. I didn't actually say that, but I heard it in my mind. Weird. Okay, that was a thought. All right, what else is here? What's the next thought? Bring it on. And you get interested, like looking for thoughts. And then it's like, wait a minute, what am I looking in, right? Now, that's not a thought. That's like, an, it's something that becomes interesting in a different way. You can feel it. It's like, oh. 
I am like the substance of thought, right? Now, even if that comes, you can just recognize too, that's a thought. Like if you're concluding something. But it starts to have a different feel, and I'm trying to point that out, that it's like, oh, you start to pick up something that, wait a minute. It's very clear that there are no thoughts, and I don't have to have a thought to see that. But by becoming really interested in what the next thought is going to be, it actually causes gaps between thoughts, which is really interesting. But it doesn't matter. You don't have to contemplate that. And if you do notice it, oh, there's gaps between thoughts. Okay, well, that's another thought. What else is here? Yeah, things become very quiet, very still, very quickly. I have two videos on this. Thoughtless space, I think they're called. But this is it. This is the key. Just keep being vigilant, ruthlessly vigilant about what a thought is. Oh, gosh, it's been so long. You know, I've tried so hard. I haven't woken up. That's a thought. Wow. Okay. It's gone now. Doesn't define me. What's next? Bring it on. And just look. Oh, but every time I, this works for a minute and I feel it. And then every time I get this far, then all of a sudden I start thinking again. Oh, that's a thought. Okay, what else? What else we got? Bring it on. Looking, 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 right? Vigilant. Pay attention. That's pretty much the approach I took. Okay? De-identifying from thoughts. Don't make conclusions. Oh, gosh. Oh, I'm de-identifying from thoughts. And this must be what Angelo talked about. This Is this pure consciousness? Thought. That's a thought. Cool. What else? What else we got? And then... Let me just say it this way, but please don't think about it and reify it in your mind and make it into something you're looking for. But the, the consciousness that you're in looking for thoughts just expands. It starts to expand, sort of. But again, if you make a thought about that, remind yourself, oh, that's another thought and just keep looking. Okay. So that's approach number two. Approach number three, who am I? Who am I? I'm obviously not any thought that comes through this mind or story, obviously, just as we described earlier. Because if the thought says, I'm a good person, does that suddenly make you a good person? I'm a bad person? Oh my gosh, did that thought suddenly make you a bad person? It's a reflection. It's, a, it's sound in the mind, right? I'm always like this. I'm always like that. My girlfriend's always like this. My boyfriend's always like that. Thoughts, 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 thoughts. They don't define anything. But... Who the heck am I that's aware of those thoughts? Whoa. What's receiving the thoughts? What's aware of the thoughts? Look there. And very quickly you'll find you can't look there. Because you're looking from there. That's not awakening yet. But you'll notice it, right? And that's just very strange. But keep trying. And you'll probably feel frustration. And you'll probably want to think about it. Well, maybe it's like this, like that. Oh gosh, that's thoughts. Those are thoughts. But who am I that's aware of that thought? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? You don't need to say it like a mantra, but if you mean it and you're really curious in this way I'm describing, because it gets very curious very quickly when you realize all these thoughts I thought defined me never defined me. So who am I? Or what am I? What am I? What am I? And you're kind of looking experientially. Until it's not a looking anymore, it's a settling in. Kind of, It just kind of goes inward, actually. But you still ask, who am I? And if you get distracted, lost in thought, fine, return. Who am I? If you notice the body straining, relax it. Just relax a little bit. Who am I? might start to get quiet. But if there's a thought that says it's getting quiet, you just notice, oh, that's a thought. Who am I? And when it starts to quiet down, when you start to be clear that you're not going to actually find something, but nothing has shifted, nothing's changed, that's fine. Then you can shorten it to who. Who. Notice that impulse of who. Where is it coming from? Who? Now, merge with it. Who? Stay with it. Don't separate yourself. Don't separate yourself. Don't think about it. 
Don't think about what not separating yourself means, just who. Stay with it. Stay with it throughout meditation. Stay with it when you get up off of the meditation mat. Go to sleep with it. And as soon as you're distracted, as soon as there are thoughts, back to who, who. Now, if you have a question that's a fundamental question that's different than this, that's fine. Use that. What was my face before my parents were born? What is the sound of one hand? What is Mu? These are Zen questions, but they're fine. Mu is sort of what led me in, but it became beyond a word. It goes beyond Mu, beyond what is my face. It becomes a singular focus. Don't separate from that focus. It becomes wordless, contentless, thoughtless. It's like the core of identity, maybe, but it's just something you can merge with. Stay merged. Don't, don't separate yourself. This is one pointed approach. My book describes it. And just keep going. Don't listen to the narratives. Don't listen to the narratives that are defining your experience because they're thoughts. Every one of them is a thought. None of them are more or less true about you, right? That familiarity of thoughts and stories makes it seem like one's true and one's not. But the more you de-identify from thoughts, the more you see this, the more you become one-pointed, the more obvious it is, geez, none of those thoughts actually define anything. But it sure felt real. This feels more real. Who? Stay with it. Don't separate. Like your life depends on it. Commit to it. For me, it was like, oh, I'll do this till the grave. <laughs> it had that kind of, it just caught fire. Don't worry about whether it catches fire for you, though. Just keep merging. Keep staying one-pointed in your drive to know truth, living truth crossover.